the pandemic really fucked everyone's trust with injectable drugs. It hasn't necessarily ruined our lives so much, but it's given us the opportunity to obtain status that we could never have obtained before. So like, I never even asked him if he was selling it. So I was like, I want some. He was like, okay, this is what you're gonna take. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm here with James Smith. James is a PT, a Jiu Jitsu purple belt, a YouTuber and three time number one Sunday Times bestselling author and the Gordon Ramsay of fitness. Author of Not a Diet Book, Not a Life Coach, and How to Be Confident. James, I've enjoyed your content for honestly a long ass time. One for like your honest and transparency, but uh, I think you've also got such a, an interesting perspective that some may find polarizing and I personally find super intriguing. So I find it, I honestly find it pretty funny too whenever you call out other uh, content and fitness influencers like me, of course. So thanks for uh, coming on the podcast. No, it's, uh, it's my pleasure, mate. Like, to be fair, it's it's quite an easy tactic. I'm surprised not many other people kind of utilize where if I look at my business, the only people that will never, ever put money in my pocket is bodybuilders and fitness influencers. So if I create content having a pop at those guys, I'm not damaging or hindering my business of anything. In a, in, in a strange way, I'm actually benefiting the business. And it's, it's one of those things where people are... It's, if you're a butcher... You don't need to worry about the opinion of vegetarians. <laughs> no, yeah, that's true. So I'd like to start with this quote, one I think you're familiar with. Realize that sleeping on a futon when you're 30 is not the worst thing. You know what's worse? Sleeping in a king bed next to a wife that you're not really in love with, but for some reason you're married, you got a couple kids, and you got a job you hate. You'll be laying there fantasizing about sleeping on a futon, there's no risk when you go after a dream, but there's a tremendous amount of risk to playing it safe. Quote by Bill Burr that you love. So can you tell me a little bit about your 20s and how you started? Yeah, mate. Like, um, I remember there's probably that quote and maybe two others, which I was kind of, I was just a PT through my 20s. I played rugby uh, at weekends and I used to travel a lot on the like seven circuit. Like I was never that good, but if you're good enough to play for a team and you've got like good banter, there'd be a team like, oh, we're in Copenhagen this weekend. Oh, we're in Denmark. Oh, we're going to Dubai. So you travel around a lot. And while everyone was kind of like saving their money, doing the right thing, I kind of reached like 27 single. I actually moved back in my parents at 27, which really helped my PT business. Because although all my friends that were moving on with their life, I was like waking up, going to the kitchen, having leftover food in Tupperware boxes that my mum had cooked the night before, coming home from PT in and like I'd make my bed in the morning, but my mum would have come to my room and squared up the sheets a bit. And they knew how tired I was because I was doing like 10, 12 hour days. And like I come home and my parents knew I just didn't want to talk. You know, you know that period of your life where you're just slamming yourself. And I was kind of always a bit anxious that I was doing life wrong. Like my friends were settling down, they had mortgages. And I remember seeing that Bill Burr quote, a good friend of mine actually sent it to me. And I was like, do you know what? The only thing worse than being late to the party or the only thing worse than my current setup would be doing all the things I should have and regretted it. And it was quite a liberating quote. And I reckon Bill Burr, when he said that, he's just, he's just free balling. He's the things that come out of that guy's mouth when he's chatting and he's got so many good points. And it was just completely unfiltered life advice that he probably doesn't even know impacted me or impacted the people who I put it in front of with the books. How did that resonate with you? It, well, clearly considering that I'm a, in my latter half of my 20s and I'm single and doing nothing but working 24-7 definitely resonated to a, to a, a large extent. But I, I do still think that there's a there's definitely a large, there's a large size of people out there, especially in, in America, outside of, say, Southern California, that you see kind of just play their life playing it safe. You know, entering a family, having children at an early age, you know. And I think for some of these people, for sure, there's a certain sense of fulfillment that comes with that, as well as having those kids. Um, but my curiosity is, I think everybody, no matter who you are, whether you are doing, you know, you're focusing on your work and yourself, or whether or not you have decided to, quote unquote, play it safe and start with a family, I think everyone has a consistent consideration of the other option, right? There's always this constant, like, what if in my head? 
Like, what if I just started my business or on the other, uh, on the other end, what if I just like committed myself to that one girl? Right. Like what would have happened if that happened? Like, did I miss out on that chance? I feel like in today's society with social media, you know, we have all these, all these options that are giving us this kind of like decision fatigue where we don't know whether or not we want, uh, we, we feel like this is like the right decision for us because there may be so many, so much more potential out there, but you know, like 30, 40 years ago, we didn't have this. We didn't have the option to see the uh, millions of people out there that we never would have met or never would have seen or never would have known even existed on the other hand. Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about this and I've, this is actually a, an area that I'm kind of trying to research a bit on at the moment uh, where I'm kind of trying to uh, decide what it is that's changed and whether or not it is social media. But my kind of inclination is this. I think social media hasn't necessarily ruined our lives so much, but it's given us the opportunity to obtain status that we could never have obtained before. Rewind 500 or 1,000 years, you'd have to be a prince or a king or in the royal family to get any recognition, right? If you want to be, you know, hailed by people, stopped in the streets, people giving you their babies because they are, oh, you know, I want my babies in this guy's arms, right? Let's say 1,000 years ago, you'd have to be part of the royal family. But now we have a system where you can obtain success, notoriety, financial liberty, all of these things. You know, America is the forefront of that. You're the only country in the world where you can call yourself an entrepreneur. If you say you're an entrepreneur in Australia or the UK, they think you're a prick. So like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where the kind of what's probably going through your head is, you're like, right, there's opportunity in front of me. That's the main reason why you're probably single. The main reason you're probably not settled down with a woman and not every man sees that opportunity to climb it. And now, I'm out of the game now, I'm 34, but the whole way through my 20s, I didn't even realize what I was doing, but I can look back and see now. I kind of looked around and I was like, nah, I'm not settling here. So what do I need to do? I need to keep developing myself, my businesses, my knowledge. Uh, I need to utilize this tool of social media. And it wasn't necessarily being well known that I wanted. And the more I understand status, uh, the more I understand it's not a bad thing. If you want notoriety for your efforts, then you know, go get it because you're probably not wired like other people. And we probably, you know, anyone out there that says they don't want to improve their level of status is just talking shit. That's why even if you're in, even if you're working for a charity, you want your charity to make the most money so that you get status from it. And people go, oh, Bill started a charity, raised $10 million for kids with cancer. He's doing that for status. That's the main reason people want to, you know, excel in different fields. And I think that I brought up as men we get told so much but really you know and ultimately at the end of the day it's not a narcissistic endeavor because with status comes options access and finances which therefore in time will allow you to find a high quality woman provide for a high quality family in a high quality area to high quality education if anything it's one of those things that only opens doors forward to everyone in your life and around them I do agree that I think we're we're originally driven with i think it's just something in our genome you know to drive for status darwin's theory survival of the fittest but i do believe that if you there are people out there that will <clears throat> i think try to retract themselves from the desire to want status and i think that's like a muscle that they have to consistently work on every day um, and I know people will work on this through like their detachment of ego through, say, um, a space where they utilize psychedelics and such. But I think that requires like a lot of a lot of fucking effort because in the end, it's our default, right, to look for that, to like strive for that. And I think as well, when you look at like, let's say, uh, going to the gym, getting strong, like in essence, Let's rewind maybe 15 years for me, maybe less than 10 years for you, because I feel old. When you're like 19, you cannot be successful in any realm of your life at 19. You can't. There might be one in a fucking billion people that, you know, ends up making loads of money. But at 19, you are just learning, right? You're trying to figure shit out. You don't really understand what you're doing. If you're 20, 21, you're in a meeting at a work in a corporate office, even if you worked at Google headquarters and you go, I've got a good idea, they'll be like, shut up, you're 20. You know nothing, right? So what <laughs> can you do? You can, you can go to the gym and you can work hard. And within a year in the gym, 
you can surpass the majority of people that have been training five years, 10 years. And you drop a bit of body fat, you understand macros, you eat a high protein diet, you develop some muscle, you are obtaining status in the gym. Now, that one time, a dude who's six years older than you, that earns 100K and drives a Porsche, comes up to you and goes, bro, can you help me with training my posterior deltoids? That is about being a man. It's about obtaining status. Is Without even noting it, the beginning of our journey in fitness is just trying to climb the hierarchy of understanding ourselves as men and our primitive urges. And then we apply our, our physique and our bodybuilding and our gym ethos to business. And then we start to, you know, then we realize, okay, it takes years to build muscle. It takes even longer than that to build a business. It takes even longer than that to understand how we work. It's like a, a never ending perpetuating journey that we kind of love and hate at the same time because you love developing your body but you know you're never going to be happy with it you love working on a business but you know there's never going to be a day where you're like oh i could retire now so like i think it's so strange that not really any people are brought up with this kind of knowledge of how our minds work mm -hmm. so if we always have that end goal in, in mind and feel like we're never really going to reach it how can we find confidence so confidence is i would say is people's relationship with failing it's not their relationship with success so imagine you got a mate who goes out on a night out, completely unfazed, approaches a girl, she shuts him down, he's like, okay, cool. Whereas if you look at someone that isn't confident, they'd approach the girl, she says, no thanks, and you go, oh fuck. You know, he'd take it really personally. I think confidence is something we really need to associate with failing. And when we look at the best businesses, people fail well. When we look at the best salespeople, we come across confidence and salespeople go hand in hand. They're the ones happy for 99 no's and one yes. You know. Even if you look, even if you look at your best wrestlers, right? The best wrestlers in America, they they will say, "Cool, I'm going to shoot 80 times. You can defend 79, but you're going to fail defending one shot eventually." In wrestling, it's never about hitting the first shot. It's always about keep going, keep going, keep going. At one point, there'll be a mistake and you get a breakthrough. Wrestlers are like the fittest athletes in the world because of their ferocious tendency to just keep going until someone fails. So, like. If we can understand that, you know, the majority of success and the majority of confidence stems from a good relationship with failing, that's another thing. Again, like you go, you go into the gym, you want a PB, you don't get it. The person who really progresses in the gym is the one who goes, okay, cool, what can I do? The person that go, oh, fuck this, you know, this is bullshit, you know, that really gets hit by that. They're the ones that kind of never progress. So mm -hmm. yeah, confidence is so much more to do with our relationship to failure. I love that. I remember this uh, was something you quoted from somebody else, but that say like you lose ju a jujitsu match, then you've lost. But if you've decided to stop doing jujitsu just simply because of that loss, that's when you become defeated. Yeah, yeah. And you're not defeated until you decide to quit. Yeah. So consistently surpassing and overcoming those failures, I think is a great perspective when it comes to true confidence. Yeah, Hicks and Gracie, he's one of the original OGs, Gracie, and he never lost a proper fight. And that was his saying, yeah. So like, even let's say, uh, for anyone listening in the physique realm, if you go to a bodybuilding comp and you come last, you haven't lost, you just come last. If you stop and you go, I'm never competing again. Okay, cool, now you've been defeated. And I think that lesson for me was so important because you get to set the tone before you do anything. And looking back in hindsight, Every competition I've lost that has been the best lesson. If anything, uh, have you ever have you ever trained jiu-jitsu? No, but I have a lot of friends that do, and I want to, but I'm going to get the shit kicked out of me for sure. But that's that's just the way the way it kind of works. But I'll never forget November 2020, coming out of lockdown in Australia. I've been doing quite a bit of training, and I went to a competition. I was probably a bit overconfident. My first match was into a heavyweight final, and just because of the way the brackets were, my first match was a final, and I was like. All I got to do is beat one guy, fine. I lost to him. I then I gassed out as well, which was the worst thing that could ever happen at comp where you want to win, but you just don't have the energy. I went out the gates too hard, I read lines. You know, like if you've done like a CrossFit workout where you don't read the workout right, and then halfway through, you're like, I'm ahead of everyone. And then you just hit a wall and you're like, fuck, can't get your heart rate back down. You're like, I've lost. That happened to me. I then had to wait five hours to fight the same guy again in Nogi where he beat me. Then I went on to a tap to BO in my next match. This guy went north south on me and he stunk so bad in my face. I tapped, went to the toilet, washed my face, 
Then I lost my next match. And all my friends that I went to the tournament with won gold. So I'm sat in a car on the way back from a tournament. I've lost every match. Worst day of my life. All my friends won. They're at McDonald's. They're eating burgers. Oh, do you see my sub? Do you see my sub? <laughs> and the next day, I genuinely woke up depressed. And my housemate goes, thought you were supposed to be good at jiu-jitsu. I needed that. <coughs> I needed that, right? Now, when we do sparring, you have the opportunity to rest whenever you want. I have not rested one round since November 2020 because of that day. And even when I teach a class, I won't stand for it. I'm like, get on the mat. They're like, I'm tired. I'm like, well, defend yourself tired. Worst case scenario, you get tapped out for five minutes, but you're not rested. Like, I've got PTSD from this day of losing all my matches. And looking back, it's the most grateful. The days where I've won all my matches, that's not really benefited me. You know, like, it's cool, you get a medal. And looking back at it now, the the probably serotonin or dopamine response that I'm getting from winning is good, but it's short-lived. It's very short-lived. You get home, you're like, cool. You're like, this medal takes up too much room. They're just in a cupboard somewhere. But the losses... That's a slow burning effect that motivates you and gets you out of bed. You know, embarrassment is one of the best teachers of, of like effort. You know, like the day, the time you're really shown up, that's where people go away. They go underground and they come out and they find another gear. So like, it, it's crazy that, you know, in the world we're looking at now, like kids in schools, they're not really, they don't have losers anymore. Everyone gets a medal for participation. Like, the losers need to be losers because that's often where winners come from. It's the people that get bullied at school that end up being the black belts. You know, it's like... That's facts. You need you need people at the bottom of the food chain. Otherwise, how do they learn to climb up it? Mm -hmm. That's so facts, man. Every Everyone I know that's been just uh, absolute workaholics but have found success in their lives is because they've gone through that pain. Pressure is a blessing. And um, something that uh, Andrew Huberman actually said in one of his most recent podcasts that I think all athletes should really keep in mind regardless of what you do well i guess regardless of whether or not you're an athlete or not but <clears throat> the way that stress acts upon you is all based off of what you believe of stress and what you've been taught about it so if you've been taught your entire life that stress is hindering you and hindering your gains stress is bad stress is cortisol you don't want too much stress then that's what it's going to do but if you've learned that stress which it does will actually hone in your focus and increase your performance than it will. So I think in believing that, really understanding that that stress can do that for you and then allowing yourself to put, you know, go under that pressure and even fail when you need to is the key for us to continue to improve, succeed, and then obviously find that confidence in ourselves too. Yeah, I think it, and do you know what? This is why jiu-jitsu is such an amazing teacher because you you can get over-aroused. And it's like an inverted U theory and it's used in sport quite a lot of arousal. So like, not, not bonus, but being like aroused for sport performance. Sometimes at the beginning of that inverted U, there's not enough stress. So let's imagine you're playing, I'll call it soccer, right? You're playing soccer and you're like, you're shooting goals from 40 meters away or however many yards. If there's no one there, there's almost not enough pressure for you to be really hitting them right. If there were five of your mates there, you've now got some people there that you like want to show off in front of, so you're going to keep working. But if there was 50,000 people there, there's going to be way too much pressure and you're probably going to cave. There's always that sweet spot. And people need to train through their lives to, to slowly, progressively overload that sweet spot. I'm very fortunate with doing talks in front of big audiences that we got to creep that audience size up quite slowly. But jiu-jitsu, like... You go in there and sometimes the stress takes hold of you. You make bad decisions, then you panic as well. So nothing, no round is that important. But then when you're at competition, it's very important. And then like there's, after your first comp, your forearms, I finished a match before where I was like, I couldn't close my hands because of how hard I'd been gripping someone. My forearms were fully gone. I was like, where is this strength come from? It's like, you know, when people have like epileptic fits, sometimes they get muscle soreness for months. Like there is strength within us that we can very rarely tap into. But one of the best kind of things is in life, when, when you start being successful, especially financially, everything goes your way. You become yes men, you become comfort, you become traveling business class so you don't even have to queue up to go through security at the airport. Everything in your life gets easier. But with jiu-jitsu, everything remains getting harder. And I'll never forget, I did this talk 
and I had like 300 personal trainers in the room and it was the most money I'd ever earned in a day. The net, I was flying. I was like killing it. Great event, everything. Next day, went to a competition, got heel hooked in the first match, lost, went home, didn't even break a sweat. And I was like, this is so good for grounding. And I think this is why Zuckerberg, Huberman's done a little bit with Lex Friedman. Lex Friedman's a black belt. Rogan's a black belt. These guys have had like a continual humbling throughout their whole career, which I think really does keep people grounded because you need to keep failing. And unfortunately, the better you get a business and life, you don't fail much. And there's always money can buy you out of almost everything. And I think failing is such an integral part to the human psych that if you don't have these things that make you really uncomfortable, it's really going to hinder your growth. So I got another quote from you. Uh, you're currently living in part of your life that you used to look forward to the most. Can you expound on this? I saw it on a TikTok a few years ago. I saw that quote on a TikTok and it hit home for me. And no I, way. Yeah. I saw, <laughs> and you know what? It was just some. It was just some like just some random, random person. Not even like a big account or anything. And I was like, whoa, whoa. And like, it's crazy, right? Because when we're younger, we, you know, when you're 14, you're like, I can't wait till I have some money. Then you get a bit of money and you go, ah. Oh, can't wait to have my own place. Then you get your own place. You're like, can't wait till I get a pay rise. And you get a pay rise. We're on this constant hedonic treadmill. Mm -hmm. But then you sometimes you stop and you're like, fuck. You're like, again, that inverted you. You don't want to be too young. You don't want to be too old. You want something perfectly in the middle. For the majority of us, we're slap banging it. But then I realized at 28, like, I was, at 28, I would have loved to have had a bit more money. But now at 34 with a bit more money, I'm like, oh, I'd love to be 28 again. Like there's so many of these little like mind fucks <laughs> as we go through life. That was like, oh, I could, at 28, I could drink heavily on a night out and still function the next day. But then, you know, you kind of have these like grateful switches in between. But for a lot of people, they, they do need to wake up and realize, hold on. You know, you're, you're right in the middle of the part you used to look forward to as a kid, yet you don't feel like that. You're stressed, you're worried, you're concerned. You, you mm -hmm. know, you're out, you're, you're reading Twitter threads between Biden and Trump and you're like, you're like, oh, Who's going to run for the next election? You, you're not enjoying your present day because of that. When really, you know, so many people could look back and, you know, I kick myself sometimes. I go, James, mate, you used to have to go to work in a suit every day. And now you're pottering about your house, playing with your dog or whatever. Like we, we can l be so distracted in life. We don't realize how important it is to enjoy the exact part of our life we're in now. Yeah, I think that's extremely important. We wake up every morning with just like a reset. That's what I what I truly believe. We we wake up every morning with a reset, and in order for us to put ourselves back in a perspective where we are living, I guess, in a state of abundance. I don't know if people like to believe in that that phrase, but I truly do believe that the perspective matters. If you're always thinking, I don't like, I haven't achieved enough. I don't have that much. Like I'm not doing well. I think that's going to compound, and. I think it's really important every single morning to like practice that, like, where did I come from? You know, like, where was my starting place? Because remembering that is a victory, right? Every single one of those things, those things that you progress in is a victory. And every time you achieve a victory, that's where like that dopamine rush comes in, your testosterone increases, etc. But if we forget that, that perspective affects our performance. And the same thing can be true with a relationship. If we see our relationship as the car, the sports car we always wanted that we bought 10 years ago, and now it's old. That's how it's gonna be, right? You're gonna get tired of that relationship. But I think in order to like keep a relationship going, you have to look at that person as a new person every day. You have to recognize that like, holy shit, this is the girl that I've always wanted. Um, and now that I have her, you know, I could lose her at any second. So I need to like take them out on dates. I need to do something special, say they're amazing and remarkable and beautiful, whatever. I think it's important that we just need to like, you know, write this in our calendar or something like a clock, like, uh, write five things that you're grateful for. And I think that's going to propel people forward. Yeah. One of my biggest weakness is acknowledging wins like, uh, I set a milestone, even that play button behind. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be amazing? Day I got it, felt nothing. I was like, I want a gold one. Then I work, I work tirelessly towards a gold one and then I'll get it. Then I'll be like diamond, diamond or nothing. You know, like, but to me, that's how my brain works. Like even like uh, I've come, I've got diagnosed with ADHD earlier this year, which 
I'm, I'm not medicated or anything like that, but I could say, I could tell something was up and my missus was watching a lot of TikToks and she was like, this is you. Like the, she, she pretty much like, was like, you need to get an assessment because I've got just this real tendency to even, she'd be telling me something important. I got those TikToks, dude. Bro, but they were like spot on. Like there was this, I do this thing where I'll order the smallest thing off Amazon and I'll forget like memory cards, right? The next day a parcel comes, yeah. she's like, what did you order? I'm like, I don't know. But then when it comes through, it's like Christmas and I get this dopamine spike. Then uh, she'll be telling me something important. I'll be like, we need batteries. She'll be like, excuse me? She'll be like, I've just been telling you. But like, it's not that I don't care about what she's saying. It's just that at that very point, my short-term memory is so terrible that when I did remember, I was like, I need to, I need to get this out and tell you with it. But I've also come to realize with work, uh, I get a lot of dopamine from putting out content that performs well. Now, that probably explains why I put a video out every single day for fucking six years. Because it wasn't so much that I wanted a big following or like a boom in business or whatever. To me, it's like a video game and I love playing video games. So I was like, when I started posting on social media and the video did well, I didn't realize I was kind of self-medicating my low levels of daily dopamine through having ADHD. So I was like, everything I do, if I put out a YouTube video and it performs well, I can enjoy it for like three hours. I'm like, fuck yeah. But then the next day I put one out that doesn't do well. And instead of being down about it, it super motivates me. Cause I'm like, right, no dopamine today. Let's get it tomorrow. And I obsess over it. And like, but then when something, when the accumulating effects of all those wins comes together, like a million followers or a sold out event, I don't even, I can't enjoy it. And then we did an event in the UK, three and a half thousand people, one venue, one night. Did I was like, oh, that's cool. They were like, are you going to enjoy it? I was like, oh, not till I finish the event. The event's got to go well. <laughs> then the event went really well. Afterwards, they're like, oh, so how'd you feel? I was like, oh, I'm a bit tired, really. I had one pint of Guinness and then went home. Stayed at my parents. Didn't even, didn't even celebrate it. Didn't even celebrate the biggest night of my life. And I've already brushed it off. And I'm like, oh, half an arena would be good. It's something that I do definitely struggle with to acknowledge the wins. But yeah, it, it's something I'm trying to work on. I think that's a default for everybody, though. Dude, that's just the struggle. Honestly, always wanting more. I'm hella impressed though by how often you shoot out content at such like a incredibly rate at such a high quality, dude. Um, if you don't mind me asking, how long do you think it takes you to, to make each video? If I do like a short form content video, I can record it and edit it in like 35 minutes. So like, uh, damn, yeah, like the, the ADHD side of me again was this hyper focus. So when I'm writing books or editing, I can sit for like two hours at a time. And like, I got taught to use Premiere Pro like a year ago and I'm quicker than the person that taught me to use it already. And, but when it comes to YouTube, like this is the thing though, because I like good quality. I like getting all the cuts in and everything, but I don't want too much quality in it. I did a edit with a guy the other day and I like putting out video the same day I record. So I found a videographer finally who will record in the morning it's like midday. He's like, when do you want this? I'm like, 4 p.m. And he's like, he's like, I best go. <laughs> so like, to me, I love that because I can get it in and out in the same day. But the, this one videographer, it took him four days to get the edit back. And he was like, oh, I'm just trying out some different music things. I was like, mate, this isn't Oppenheimer. All right, this isn't the fucking, the biggest movie ever. I was like, this content's just got to resonate with people. It's just got to get a message. But yeah, for me, it's, it's definitely something I obsess over where... I much prefer shorter deadlines, which is another thing to do with ADHD. So when someone's like, oh, can you write a book in a year? I'd be like, I'd rather have nine months. They go, how about six? I'm like, deal. Because <laughs> then, then, then I have to do like two hours a day. Otherwise, if you give me two years to write a book, I'll be like, oh, I'll start that next month. Oh, I'll start that next, you know, I'll start that in a few weeks time. <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, but like, I, I just really enjoy it. Like I say, I get a buzz from it. And when something performs well, it like, gives me purpose but the weird thing is i can never truly appreciate the numbers on it so like say the say the story views are like eighty thousand. i'm like oh so shit i'm like they're at 200 last year or whatever on instagram and then someone's got to be like that's a stadium that's a full stadium of people watching you chase your dog and i'm like oh and you put it like that everything to me is like a top score in a game it's not reality which i don't think many people really it's very difficult to actually quantify thousands of people absorbing your content. To me, it's like high score, low score. Like I, I play Call of Duty most days. I, I obsess over the numbers. How many kills? Um, what was your damage? What was your kill death ratio? So like 
I think a lot of social media to me is that gamer inside me. I know obviously that hopefully it's benefiting people's lives and helping them. But at the top level, I'm just like, how can I get a high score today? Yeah. Yeah, bro. But that's that's the hedonic treadmill, right? Mm. We we get a high score and that, that slowly starts becoming like just the higher of a normal. And then we get like a lower score from that, which was way higher than it was a year ago. But that sucks because it wasn't nearly as good as the last video. I think <laughs> it's like, it's just, uh, we are, I don't know. I think everybody has some, some sort of uh, ADDs to some extent, but we're very forgetful humans. So it's just, it's very easy to, to forget whatever it was that, that sated us and gave us that dopamine rush previously and then just look for the next rush. Yeah, I found, um, so I, I had to do like a four hour uh, like assessment when I got tested and there's one where they put like an ECG onto your brain and they get you to do a maths test. They get you to look at a painting and they get you to close your eyes. And they, my hyperactivity isn't physical, it's mental. So like, I wish I had the physical hyperactivity because I burn way more calories. My knee would be massive. Like people that have got <laughs> genuine ADHD with like the actual physical hyperactivity, they're burning, they're burning so many calories moving. So like mine is all mental. So like, I'll just, I'll just think about stuff. And when they were doing the assessment, one thing I need to do, I need to listen to podcasts. I fall asleep. Otherwise my mind just goes bing, 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 just thinking about stuff. It's only if I listen to a conversation that I can actually fall asleep. So it's great for like the creative side of things. Like I love being creative because someone will say, oh, I've got an idea for a video. And I'll be like, here's five titles, here's five intros. No, this is a better hook. Why don't we bring this in? And like every kind of flaw that people have is definitely a big strength. Like we need this diversity between kind of ways that people think you need guys slightly on spectrum. You need guys fucking ADD. You need some guys like, every, you need someone from everything. You need someone who's a bit boring, a bit bland. You need someone who's a bit risk averse. And it's that kind of uh, unique differentiators between people that kind of determines, you know, a balanced think group for different tasks. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you don't mind me asking, do you, um, so you've been editing all your stuff yourself since before this editor? Yeah, so uh, up until last week. And even then, like, if we're using two camera angles, I'll just get him to put it together. And then I'll say to him, like, look, even if there's, two scenes you're not sure about, put them in and I'll, I'll chop the one I want. And one thing that I'm I've been, only in the last two months have I become super ruthless with tr cropping bits and like, I'll get a 12 minute video. I'm like, let's get it to nine. But yeah, I do all my kind of editing myself, like um, use it, learn how, and you know what? Up until last year, it was all iMovie. So I was editing all my shorts sideways. Holy shit. Yeah, bro. Like, so I hired someone to help me in the office and she was like, what is that? I was like, it's iMovie. She's like, <laughs> she's like, are you editing sideways? I was like, yeah, this is just how I do how I do things. So I put my DSLR portrait, but then as I put it into iMovie, so I'd be there like looking sideways, doing my edits. Uh, so yeah, like, you know, I was doing it pretty village for a long time. But yeah, I, I love the editing process. It's super relaxing. Like, no matter what I'm doing, it, it just gives me calmness to be in the edit, to do things. Then when I export it, I'm like, wow. I, I think even if no one watched the video, I enjoyed making it. And some of my, I, I get from like a productivity standpoint, what is great is that I can now pass it to someone to trim the fat. And then he'll send me a thumbnail and I'll be like, send me the images. I learned how to use Photoshop the last couple of months. I'm like, send me the images, bro. Like th there's always going to be that element of people not having the same vision as you, but the guy, yep. the guy is very close. And he knows that one of my most, one of my favorite values is impatience where like, my missus, the current girlfriend I'm with, well, current girlfriend, cool, that sounds bad. My partner at the moment, who I'm very happy with, she uh, she kn <laughs> she knows how impatient I am, right? So if I, I'll be like, oh, I've got an idea for a video. She's like, come on then, let's go record it. Because she'll know that it will just take up time in my mind. Or like, yeah, she's like, come on then, let's, let's do it. Then she'll stop what she's doing to help me with the edit. And um, then she'll be like, well, we're going out in half an hour. I'll be like, yeah, I'll just edit this quick then. She'll be like, okay, cool. But it's important that, yeah, I just, I don't know whether or not I'll spoil it as a kid or I've genuinely got some impatience issue. I'll eat food cold because I don't want to wait two minutes to microwave it. Like to me, <laughs> I'm hungry. That's why I love sushi and sandwiches and stuff like that. Someone's like, oh, should we go get some food? I'm like, nah, because if that waiter takes too long to serve us, it's going to ruin my day. You know, it's like I need to feed those impulses. No, bro, I... <laughs> I eat food cold too. I don't know what it is. 
sometimes I also just sometimes I just eat it cold because if I like heat it up, I like it needs to be like fresh and hot. Except it takes me so fucking long to eat that once it starts getting cold or like room temperature, I get irritated. Yeah. Because room, I feel like room temperature food just sucks. It has to be either like hot or cold. So I don't know. I just sometimes I just fucking eat. And there's something good. Eat the shit cold. There's something good about how gross like Chinese food and pizza is when it's cold. That I love it. You know. Yeah. I, 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 I just never phased by it. Never phased. Like having a cold sausage or something. I'm like, yeah. Even if it's got a bit of fat on it, I'm like, just can't bother to eat it up. And also, I'll never forgive myself. If I microwave something for too long and it's too hot, I'm like, brilliant, great, brilliant. That's the, I can't eat it now. I've just ruined it. So then I burn my mouth and now I resent the bit of food that I had for burning me. You're better off just eating it cold. If you want to help fund the podcast as well, you can use code Nile for a discount off of Young LA Clothing and huge supplements. All right. So uh, let's talk some dirty little industry secrets. You uh, created a video on... Yeah, I remember you creating a video on YouTube. Could you tell me a little bit about what is the fitness industry's little dirty little secret you were talking about? Oh, well, clenbuterol. That was one that used to float around the rugby club back in the day. Like, and it was like high-level bodybuilders that would kind of be like, oh, I've got this fat loss drug. So we'd get on that all the time, a couple of weeks out from a holiday. But like, even back in the day before I was a PT, we weren't even tracking calories and we're taking clenbuterol then. There was one rugby player who I was friends with who just got massive. So, like, I never even asked him if he was selling steroids. I was like, I want some. He was like, okay, this is what you're going to take. And, like, again, for me, so many of the people I looked up to in the fitness industry who were claiming natural, I was like, wow, these guys must know so much about nutrition. They must know so much about training splits and hypertrophy. <laughs> you know, like, genuinely, even at, like, 24, I, I genuinely was like, these guys are natural. And then I was like, I'm going to, I take steroids. Like there, there must be some, there must be some natural secret out there, right? Yeah. And I was like, look, I'm, that everyone just wants to know. I'm just going to take a little shortcut so I can catch up with these, nat these natural guys. And um, then, yeah, I did a few cycles of testosterone, uh, SIP, then NF8. Uh, we do like 10, 12 weeks, responded super well to it. And I was like, wow, I'm starting to look exactly like these natural guys. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> then like so many people who, who like you get them you're like come on mate i know come on they're like okay yeah i'm doing a little cycle here a little cycle there um but do you know what i don't i don't blame people so much because it is a competitive industry and if you want to look good in the competitive industry you need to do what it takes to look good and you know like they have a natural category but who the hell is really talking about the natural category um so like i don't blame people but the transparency thing is the hard thing because so many people have so many brand deals and endorsements that, you know, are stigmatized by it. So, yeah, it's uh, it's something that probably did like three cycles in my life. I loved them all, but then coming off was like, oh, I was I was definitely in that vicious cycle of a few months on, a few months off. Then I was like, oh, that's my last one. Then two months later, you're like, oh, I feel a bit flat. Could just do one more. Could <laughs> just do one more. And I was very fortunate to get into jiu-jitsu, which really then took me away from that cycle of that because now I can get a little bit weedy, a bit scrawny, and it doesn't matter. My performance and my feedback isn't based on how much mass I have anymore. And doing six months into jiu-jitsu, coming off my last cycle, I've never had so many compliments about looking healthy than I did versus nice. when I was on. So yeah, and yeah, no, it's crazy. I've had that as well. I've had that as well. People will like, whenever I come off something, they're like, wow, you look, you look kind of healthy right now. I'll be like, well, fuck, bro. Why the fuck am I bodybuilding? <laughs> but it's my biggest passion, so that's why I'm doing it. But I completely, dude, I really, really relate to you on um, the space of like, I don't really hate, like, I, I can't, I just, uh, I don't feel, I don't feel like I have the right to hate on anybody in the industry who just keeps quiet about it or whatever it else whatever it is they're doing because the reality is if you want to like what what spikes people's interest in social media is curiosity right every thumbnail you ever made in, in youtube is like clickbait because what you want to fucking sit someone's curiosity you want to make them curious about clicking on your fucking video uh so when it comes to like a physique a prime physique that you want Everybody's curious about what he's doing. Everybody, literally everybody. But guess what? The moment that you decide to 
I don't know, give the cat a bone or what? Ah, fuck that, that's not that's not even a fucking saying. But the moment you decide to uh, give them what it is they want, they know it. the curio- the curiosity has been sated, and there's a sense of mystery that seems to interest people and uh, I guess increase the engagement of whatever it is that you're trying to create. And so I know that even if it's um, say that even if it's sponsors that you don't want to anger by coming open about these things or you don't want to promote drug usage that could hurt someone's health there is also a sense of like it's really hard to just be open about it because you know you could lose all the potential possibilities of like becoming someone or something that you've ever wanted yeah so it's easier to just stay shut it's also you even see now elite bodybuilders who are transparent they're not being fully transparent they're like yeah i'm on a bit oh but just a tiny bit like Arnold talking about his cycle back in the day. Oh, I was only on for three months of the year or, you know, like C-bum, C-bum yeah. could, could potentially have these amazing physiques. But now it's like almost become trendy for people to say they're on a third of what they're on. They're like, oh yeah, I'm just running, just running this little, you know, that's pretty much a TRT dose. You're like, bro, you're 260 pounds. Like, you know, you there's, because then they have this other thing where they can't really explain their full cycle because then kids will go, wow, if I want to be the next C-bum, I need to take this, this, and do this. this. Yeah, so the, exactly. I do see yeah. the, the issue with that. But like, it's crazy as a society that like, if your kid wants to binge drink and get pissed six nights a week, that's fine. Just don't get in your car. You know, if your kid wants to smoke vapes and you know, oh yeah, that's fine. Just don't do it in a venue. You know, it, so many of these things, oh, you want to get, you know, Oxycontin for a back pain. That's fine. Just get a prescription. You know, there are so many things in life that are going to fuck us. You know, but yeah, when, it, when you're like, oh, mine is uh, chicken, broccoli, and heavy weights, they're like, oh, mate, you know, we got to worry about the kids. we got to worry about the kids. It's like, strange, you want to <laughs> keep the kids off test if they want to be a bodybuilder, but if they've got gender dysmorphia, oh, get them on it. Get them on it. You know, like, it's, it's one of those things where uh, the testosterone debate is going to be interesting as well because environmentally, testosterone rates are fucking plummeting, like substantial amounts, like pharmacological intervention is inevitable i feel i Mm -hmm. have a weird sense that 10 15 20 years especially when you know a lack of testosterone in men is a big problem psychologically physiologically uh probably societally and at some point a huge cohort or a growing cohort of men are going to need to trt not just to look good but to feel good and to function uh so it's an interesting way that we're going to move where, you know, in 50 years, every single man could be on, you know, exogenous testosterone, but then we might have a fertility crisis. It's, there's so much going on that, yeah, it's a very, very confusing world from an endocrino- endocrine system outlook for both sexes. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I half agree with you. I have agreed with you when you were telling me about how, um, I guess a lot of bodybuilders these days will lie about their dosages. And I think a lot of this is true, or at least a lot of them will uh, try not to speak about it. And I think, to be honest, it's probably a smart move to just not speak about the actual dosages and the actual things someone is taking. I don't think it's right to lie about it. But uh, there is a few bodybuilders out there that I do believe have been truthful about their dosages because I do think that there's a lot of people out there that blow the amount of dosages required to do anything way out of proportion simply because of Reddit pages and some shit like that on the forums. Because you got some dumbass kids that were in the gym that decided to take 1.5 grams of test or something because they thought that's what's necessary to become an IFBB pro, like open bodybuilder or something. And then these guys blow up with tons of acne, lose all their hair, and then all this other shit that happens. Like, I think people got to realize, like, just because one person's taking 1.5 grams does not mean that you are. There's someone that will respond to five milligrams of Adderall, whereas other people will respond to 50 milligrams of Adderall. Like there's a wide, wide difference in dosing protocols for any drugs for any person. So wide. So why the fuck should everybody be taking the same steroid? So I think that's what people really don't understand. Um, And I have noticed that there does seem to be a trend where 500 milligrams of test does actually seem to be like a good place for a lot of people to do in the off season. And every time someone says that a lot of kids are like, dude, you're fucking lying. Like bodybuilders should be taking grams of gear. 
but like they just did, decided not to say whatever like primo that they added on top or whatever else that they added on top you know they just talked about their test i think it should be so, one of those things like earning money where you just kind of like yeah like, yeah i got paid well how much you get paid i'd rather not tell you and i think that's the way it should be where people have their own private yeah. life where like dosages stay off like no one no one is talking about dosages of like any other drugs like oh yeah i snorted 1.5 grams of coke you're like no i went on a bet <laughs> i went on a bender you know like how much ketamine did you do too much next question so like yeah the because like yeah. you say people carbon copy what they hear online and they will associate that with theirs it's why i fucking i can't sometimes when exactly. i hear morning routines i'm like fuck i'm like shut up like yeah someone's <laughs> like oh if i meditate for half an hour then i do cold exposure then i read a david goggins motivational quote i'll be able to get on my day some people just don't like mornings you know like it some people can be too specific with their advice <laughs> i agree with this dude i feel like if i did that it would take uh eight hours of my day mm. just to get that started in the mornings have you ever um uh played with peptides yeah 100 percent. actually you uh recently started doing a semiglutide right yeah i did uh about three weeks ago and this one was more so like i knew i wasn't going to use the whole like vial of it but i was like i'm interested because straight away i was like nah this is fucking stupid this is fucking with people but we forget there there are a lot of people out there that are on the verge of giving up like there are people out there that are losing weight to have like invasive surgery to have their stomach stapled like when you look at those kind of people i was like fuck we we just need to get people something that would reduce their appetite and i took it granted three weeks only two bouts of nausea when i tried forcing a protein shake down when i wasn't hungry ate way less felt fine energy fine feel great if anything like if my parents were like james i'm thinking of taking it i'd be like mom dad get on it it'll be mm -hmm. great for your health but um i'm gonna do a video soon on uh ipromorelin and cjc so i'm coming up to like oh yeah nice maybe eight weeks on that and it's very subtle like i didn't i wasn't it's not like going on tests but I was like, this is nice. I was like, if I next year was going to go back to Europe and I wanted to, you know, have something just to support me that was uh, endogenous and not exogenous that would just help me kind of, you know, from a standpoint of recovering a bit better. I'm like, I think it's actually great. And I know that when I do the video on it, I'm going to get so much stigma. People are like, the kids out there are going to be taking growth hormones, secretagogues. I'm like, yeah, and what? What, <laughs> what ones have you tried? Uh, I've definitely tried ipamorelin. It's been compounded with tesamorelin that I got from uh, my HRT clinic. So I've been recently partnered with an HRT clinic, which has been really nice because otherwise this shit's pretty expensive. So that's something that I, I'm not afraid to say in transparency that they've been helping me out. But obviously I use it for myself for a good reason, right? So that's why I like to tell people about it. But tesamorelin and ipamorelin was compounded and that's definitely helped uh, increase my growth hormone levels since I've always had lower IGF-1 levels, which might also be relatable to... Um, me always having lower estrogen levels would make sense. But um, anyways, for those wondering, semiglutide is um, also known as Ozempic. And that's a GLP-1 receptor agonist medication that many have used to lose weight. And Khloe Kardashian was also uh, accused, I guess, of using it. I wonder if she actually was or not. I know. I mean, who cares really? But I actually had a... I haven't used semiglutide. I have heard... A lot about its benefits which is kind of neat to hear because i think there's a stigma that people are like oh i don't want to use drugs to do this like i want to use my hard earned work and stuff but at the same time you're right testosterone levels are consistently falling i think just the uh i don't know the productivity of our bodies are just losing in efficacy each year and each decade and i think HRT medications, especially TRT. I don't like to push anything on anybody, but the facts are out there. It's helping immensely, like immensely. And I think the the divide that we need to really indicate between um, gear usage, more plates, more dates, talking about shit like steroids and all these people taking these things and HRT medication is that finding that happy medium is important in all circumstances, especially when it comes to hormone profiles. So, you know, you take too much testosterone, your LDL is going to be out of whack. Your APOB could be high. That could re that would lead to the number one killer, which is heart disease, right? Cardiovascular disease. 
and you don't ever have symptoms whenever cardiovascular disease is prominent. You could get a heart attack and you don't have any symptoms before that telling you that that's going to happen. So those are really scary things that people need to be aware of. But when you go on TRT, TRT, if you had lower testosterone than suitable for you, you would actually be helping yourself in some of these areas, such as hemoglobin, HA1C. You would actually be aiding yourself in getting a better level for your body by going on TRT rather than having um, subpar, lower than reference range levels of testosterone. So I think people should just be aware that like this HRT medication is around for a reason. And semi-glutide could probably help some people. Yeah, and if, if I ended up getting pancreatic cancer from it, I'll probably go, oh, it wasn't the best decision ever. You know, like, but to some people out there, they're, they're 10 years away from dying. Like, if, if it was cancer, you'd give them chemo. So, like, in the same respect, if someone out there is eating themselves to death, this could be the better of two evils. And I think that taking it firsthand will help, like, a lot of people understand that, you know, everyone in the fitness industry kind of shits on it. But my short-term experience with it, and again, it's a weekly administration. If people were taking it and it, and it wasn't serving them, they would stop. It's not like you're like, oh, I'll try this for another year. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think it's progress, and I think they'll, they'll probably make something better as time goes on. And I think that basically just the pandemic really fucked everyone's trust with injectable drugs at the end of the day. I think that, you know, you're like, oh, these these people before farm pharma companies, you're like, yeah, we get it. They make big money, but they help people. And then we're like, oh, actually, they're pretty deviant yeah. little fucks. And then when it comes to like other things like this, there's just general trust issues. And like now all drugs are getting a negative connotation. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one, but yeah, I think I'm I'm done with the semaglutide. Otherwise, there'll be nothing left of me. I'm really struggling to hit protein. Right. And if I was to do months of low protein and high amounts of sparring and training, I'd probably walk face first into an injury. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the end, dude, I think everybody just always has had a bad connotation of drugs. Remember, like, D.A.R.E. existed, fucking D.A.R.E., and it never even succeeded, dude. Just like, oh, don't do drugs. Like, you tell people not to do drugs, everybody's going to do fucking drugs. And, like, I think just even, you know... Um, Psychedelics were such a bad thing, you know, uh, but I think I think it's important that we all kind of relieve ourselves from this connotation, this this negative um, stigma around drugs, because I know for a fact, too, right now, when it comes to recreational drugs, right, if you're not getting them from pharmaceutical grade, there's a lot of fentanyl in it. And this is something I've learned recently, but people aren't talking about this because they don't really care about talking about uh, people who are doing drugs if they're not doing drugs. They're like, oh, well, those people were morally wrong in doing drugs. They probably shouldn't have anyways. I don't do drugs, so this isn't a worry to me. My family doesn't do drugs, so this isn't a worry to me. You have no clue if your family doesn't do drugs. You have no clue if your son doesn't do drugs. A lot of people have found their sons dead because they found out way too late that their son took like one non-pharmaceutical grade um, oxy and they took one bite out of something, like a tiny piece, and that tiny little piece had all the concentration of fentanyl in that pill. And he's dead. So I think, and supposedly Robert De Niro like doesn't even talk about this. I guess he had, uh, I don't know if it was a nephew who died. He just doesn't talk about it at all. And it's, it's associated with drugs. And so I think people just need to relieve that connotation because I think it'll be a lot safer for society if we just... Don't be afraid to talk about it as if it's something that could be possible rather than just ignoring it because it's, you know, a negative stigma. I think um, America, I think, is probably one of the worst places in the world. I'm coming over in December. December, I'm coming. And, like, I haven't seen it in a few years. I haven't been to America since, like, 2019. But from what I've heard, like, some of the cities are struggling. L.A. in particular, I've heard. Struggling, how so? Like homelessness, drug overdoses, fentanyl. Oh, yeah. Uh, econo like people just generally being uh, worse off, like uh, healthcare struggling, just like everything in a lot of cities. They're now starting to see a lot more poverty, a lot more. Um, yeah, drugs is like considering a big problem. And really, I think there's probably a bigger problem in like employment and other things. But yeah, like San Fran. And like, I went to San Francisco in 2019 and now mm -hmm. everyone's saying it's crazy. But is that just what people say overseas or is America still, still strong, still fighting the good fight? 
I mean, when it comes to news, dude, everything is over, over exaggerated all the time, right? Because it's news. But the the fact of the matter is the homelessness is on the rise for sure. And deaths due to drugs is also significantly on the rise because of fentanyl. And um, yeah, they're just having trouble, like really honestly preventing the fentanyl from even, uh, I guess, being in the drugs in America. So I think I think the issue here is that everybody's going to do drugs and a lot of people do need help. And like there's even the opioid crisis has stopped has a, a lot of doctors have stopped prescribing opioids to their patients because a lot of them are getting uh, sued for over prescribing. And so now all these patients are going to the black market in order to get what they need for them to feel OK. And a lot of these people are dying because of fentanyl overdose or fentanyl poisoning because of this. And uh, that's pretty scary and that's prominent. But these people are in need and there's a reason why medications and drugs do exist. There's a reason people take caffeine every day. Caffeine's a drug too, but simply because not as many people are dying from caffeine. It's not as negative of a stigma. But there shouldn't... I just I just truly believe that like we need to relieve that stigma so that way we can address the problem and talk about it and so that there's more awareness as for the homelessness i i really don't think i could say anything about that i really don't know too much are you in you're in california right yeah i'm in los angeles right now mate so i drive by it all the time can you can you have a word with your airport right every time i come to la <laughs> immigration two hours two and a half hours to get through in the uk when i land it takes me, thir- once it took me 13 minutes to get off the plane, get my bag and meet my dad outside. We got little face scanners, we're in. But in America, it is the pain of my life trying to get into America, <laughs> even with a visa. With the visa, still a couple hours. Even you Americans, you have to wait a long time as well, right? Yeah, yeah. But what's, what's going on there? It should be American passport, in you come, right? I... Because, uh, like I say, I'm on tour, uh, what, from December. I've got Canada first. So I'm praying that maybe going into Canada first might make it a little bit easier to come into America. But, my God, like, this this is the hardest thing. If America wants to fix anything, right, quicker. And I see they've, they've got, like, 50 kiosks in L.A. 20 of them are open. I want to, that's, that's my main beef with America, you know. It's got to be the airport. <laughs> the airport. Yeah. <laughs> like, thanks a lot, Bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they just want people to do TSA pre-check or some shit, but I, I really don't know. Mate, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's that's my biggest my biggest fear is just waiting at the airport. Because again, <laughs> I was I came to Texas last year or two years ago. I needed a wee. I was in that queue for two hours. I was like, I'm, I'm gonna piss myself rather than giving up my spot in this queue. So I reckon if I was to say to someone, I'm just going to the toilet. I'm coming back. They wouldn't let me through. <laughs> By the way, have you taken any other peptides? I'm I'm currently trialing uh, BPC-157 and uh, just started thiomycin B4, which is, uh, yeah, like another recovery one. But I don't know too much about those just yet. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they uh, seem to help heal soft tissue, uh, which I've been trying to use for the longest time because I have two shoulder impingements and a uh, a really stressed out hip flexor that these all I've had for like the last five, six years straight. So now I can't even power lift, which sucks because like everyone wants to ask me what my bench max and my squat max is and I can't. Yeah, no, I've got... Um, I don't know because... I've got like some elbow tendonitis that I'm trying to make go away. But it's, it's not aching as much, but that could just be a placebo. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate because not everybody can be Larry Wheels, but I still want to compare myself all the time. Yeah, he's a beast. <laughs> Fucking damn beast. But... Uh, as far as the peptides, I mean, I, I feel like I've seen BPC help me to like a good degree, but it's not anything that seems like it would be significant, but it's always hard to tell because if you had an injury for like five years, you know, then how do you know if it's, it's helping because it's been there for five years. So is it really going to go away? Maybe there's just something that I'm doing wrong or I, I think potentially I'm still just overtraining it. Yeah, it's one of those things where I'm I'm now at the point where I just want to uh, see if see if it can help. It must help because at the moment I'm not really doing anything to help these injuries. But it'll be interesting to see over time. I'm going to do a few more weeks 
and then report back and probably make some content on it. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited to hear about that. I know we were talking about not talking about dosages, but can you tell me about your uh, your gear experiences? Um, do you know what? I can't, like, I literally can't remember. I only remember like on the plunge, it was like 1.5, but then I can't remember how strong the vials were of uh, the test at the time, the anything, because it's literally been nearly 10 years. So like when everyone's talking about dosages, I, I didn't even know. I just said to the guy, I was like, how much am I putting in? He was like, yeah, just up to 1.5 in the syringe. I never checked. <laughs> I never checked. That's how it wasn't a crazy amount because I remember some other guys that I knew that were doing it like two weeks in they were like what these guys were like seasoned bodybuilders they were like you are you're swole they're like how are you how are you reacting this quick to it so um yeah but i honestly can't remember i can't remember damn i feel like i feel like that's common though i feel like everybody likes to just do it by ccs i've seen multiple coaches that just send their um they send their athletes just like you're gonna have four bottles of this three bottles of this two bottles of this or whatever over the course of these like 12 weeks and then you want to just take two injections each day or something. And then that's it. So they just do it. But most of these people don't even know what they're taking or like the milligrams of what they're taking and all this crap. And I think that's where it com That's where the issue comes with some bodybuilding coaches in the industry is like some of them aren't taking a good look at people's blood work and, you know, really caring about their, their biomarkers and their long term health. I think that's an, a, a huge importance. There's some coaches out there that do do this diligence. Uh, my coach is someone who does care about blood work. He makes sure that I check it up with my doctor and then I send it to him, which is nice. But I think a lot more people need to do this, or at least a lot more athletes need to be aware of this as well. Yeah, so uh, I don't think I was doing any bloods at the time either. So, like, uh, yeah, I was just winging it. I was just cowboying it. <laughs> well, I mean, on the bright side, you're not you're not competing to be a, a pro bodybuilder so i don't think you're gonna really have any issues not anytime yet you don't know don't know you're talking to i could i could turn this round in maybe a year or two <laughs> to see me at olympia so i actually do like a live on a lot of my podcasts if you're down i'm just gonna jump on the like a live on my instagram and then whoever wants to ask a question then yeah cool if they have a good question yeah, then i can it. just pop in the call if you're interested yeah, sure. cool what platform are you doing it on I just do it on my uh, podcast Instagram. Oh, okay, let's see. So what is it through Riverside? No, no, no. Um, like we're on Riverside and then I just call them on my podcast Instagram on my phone. Oh, sick. Oh, that's class. And then they just talk through my phone <laughs> into the mic. Yo, what's up, guys? Uh, what's up, guys? I'm here with uh, James Smith. I'm wondering if you guys have any uh, questions. We're just talking crap about everything. Yeah, I'm, but, I'm not scared. I mean... <laughs> Life, ooh. lifestyle conf or lifestyle confidence um uh injuries fitness nutrition peds peptides how to grow a massive gear, chest steroids oh, I'm how to grow a massive chest <laughs> yeah if you guys have any of those questions anyone just type it in the comments if you're interested and maybe you can join the call yeah dude come ask a question do you have any any questions for um james Ask anything fitness related, bodybuilding related. Maybe you'd be nutrition, you'd be diet, better to PDs. ask about the bodybuilding stuff. I just, I'll just, I'll general pop. I'll train the housewives. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions <clears throat> or wants to join the call? Yeah, bro. What's up? Do you want to, Nick? Yeah, fuck it. I'm going to just put him in. Do you know a Victor Black? No, never heard of a Victor Black. Okay. I'm a. Uh, Shooting you guys a, a live invite if you guys want to join. I'm not sure if... I guess they just want to ask the questions. So, um, Rob Pink asks, how hard is it to find a doctor that will write for TRT these days? I would, I would have no idea. I would have... Uh, I have got a clue. This is this would be a question... <laughs> this would be a question for you, I think, wouldn't it? I've, 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 yeah, probably. Yeah, I've got no idea about TRT doctor clinics. Honestly, dude, it's, it's literally not that hard. Everybody's in HRT clinic these days, so... It's really not that hard to find somebody. It depends on what your levels are. If you go to someone like Merrick, then they're probably going to want to help you like get your normal tea up first. Um, if you go to someone like Transcend, they're probably going to do the same thing, but they're usually a little bit more willing if you show that you like have a genuine desire or if you have like a reason that or like symptoms you want to address. So it's really not too hard. All you got to do is just go to their website and sign up. 
I have my own link with Transcend that's like in each description. Opinion. All Day Elite asks, have knee pain. I'm a former bodybuilder, working PT. Do you think age is just getting to me? Friends say meniscus. Do you have any thoughts on that? What's he saying? He said uh, he has knee pain and he's a former body built, natural bodybuilder. Uh, he works in PT. Do you think age is just getting to me? Friends say it's his meniscus. Uh, I don't know, really. Like, uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't really know much about meniscus. I know you guys say PT is like a physical therapist. But again, I've not really got any expertise in meniscus tears. Yeah, this guy's a this guy's a personal trainer, not a physical therapist. Okay, yeah, sometimes <laughs> you guys use both. But yeah, no, I have no idea, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, I mean, honestly, man, I think... I don't know what the issue would be, but according to Stan Efferding, he says bouts of movement are the most important. Not moving is the the last thing you want to do and the opposite of what you want to do. So if you want to if you want to improve it, just reduce your range of motion, whatever hurts, and then consistently move it maybe three times a day, separated by six hours. Darren Suto asks, what are the best mobility movements for tight hips? <laughs> tight performance. <laughs> I don't think I even know that either. Again, you're t- talking to someone that needs to put lifting shoes on to do a squat. <laughs> Dude, I have to do the same thing. I my 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 shoe inch heels are I swear to god they're like at least two inches and stuff. And then I have knee sleeves and I have a belt and I have to do all of that. So otherwise tell these uh tell the people on the live if they have any questions, they can ask them on my live tour where I'm coming to Chicago, New York, Austin. Won't be coming to LA, I'm afraid. The, the, that's the only place. I don't think I've got an event. And yeah, that'll be there in, in December doing it. Okay, but we'll have them come over and ask you some physical therapist questions. Yeah, let's do it. Like, and then <laughs> then if I'm, if I'm on stage, I'll chuck them a beer and say, shut up, ask something more interesting. <laughs> um, so a lot of people, especially men in their 20s, feel like when the weekend hits that they backtrack in their fitness progress. How can we stop the weekend from killing our diet? Oh. This is a tough one. Like, um, I think that people should maybe have a little bit of a backtrack at the weekend. You know, there's what the weekend is. Maybe eat a little bit more, take a bit of time off training, you know, refeed, rest, whatever you want to call it. I think as long as it doesn't undo the total progress of your diet, then you're fine. And if it means you have to restrict a bit more during the week, that's fine as well. But um, yeah, I think that people in their 20s probably need to be enjoying their weekends a little bit. Otherwise, you know, they've got to live their life. Mm-hmm. I agree too, but there's also a, and a certain extent of guys that I think when they think it's okay to drink one beer, they smash 10 on the weekends and that's where they come back to me and they're like, bro, like every single time I like, I make so much progress during the week and then it all just, I just fucking destroy it all on the weekends. In that case, they, pro- they probably need to stop drinking, even if it, you know, and this is again a frequency debate, right? So like. If someone gets smashed every time they have a beer, then maybe you only have a beer every other weekend. And if that's still undoing your progress, then have a beer every three weeks. And then if not, have a beer every four weeks. And then they just need to reduce the frequency in which these kind of bouts are occurring. Um, but yeah, they can always stop it at the source. I think if you're snorting too much Coke, stop drinking beer. <laughs> I think I said the same thing to uh, to my friends as well. Like, honestly, man, if it's like, if it feels like an endless hole the moment you start drinking, the best thing to do is just limit the frequency so and it's probably the hardest thing but i swear to god like there's like a sense of dopamine that that just rises when you've accomplished that one like saturday where you just didn't drink and as long as you didn't do that the next time you do is honestly so much more rewarding yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. like uh yeah that that would probably be my advice to people surrounding the weekend I saw your mom and dad weren't happy that you uh, did ketamine. Oh yeah, mate. They they get pissed off all the time. <laughs> like they they're finding out a lot about the last ten years and they're learning it through like my dad's colleagues listening to podcasts and stuff. So that can that can <laughs> stop happening soon. Um, yeah, Jesus, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's all right. They're they're getting on with it. I'm 34 now, so it's not too much of a problem. Do you mind if I ask what they uh, what they heard? Oh, everything, ketamine like uh lsd trips magic mushrooms they they're on the ball with everything my sister even dubs me in now but you know like what's the what was the ketamine story i was in soho house in austin 
and uh, I got into a bit of a K-hole and the elevator broke down. There were 14 people in it. And uh, I wasn't sure if it was a good or a bad thing. But yeah, it took, the, it took about 25 minutes for the fire department to get us out. But yeah, it's just stories like that. They're like, you did what? But like I say, they're, they're, <laughs> they're getting pretty used to it now. They're getting pretty used to it. That's hilarious. <laughs> I've gotten some of the same things from my family as well, which is a stress because they're as Asian and traditional as you could get. Yeah. So like, be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> discipline all the above honestly always always send love and i always try to visit uh maybe on christmases but other than that the distance i think makes the heart grow fonder yeah 100 percent. i'm going home in a few weeks to see mine and uh yeah it'll be really good so i'm looking forward to seeing them and getting in trouble when i see them what are the uh like magic mushroom experiences that you've had oh where where to begin uh just you know little trips to the beach with my mates, little like stories from that. But yeah, like uh, it's just something that from time to time, just go have some, just go have some fun, find out some like insightful thoughts from it. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's tough because in the UK and Australia, they're not really easing up too much on the legality of it. Where in America, I know there's a few states you can go to that you can uh, get away with it a lot more. Right. I had, a, I had a friend who's very, 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 very heavily in this industry. And he went to the psychedelics conference. And um, according to him, what seemed to be like a projection of psychedelics becoming legal within five to six years is now legal within maybe three. So looks like the process is speeding up, which is, I think, a, honestly, a phenomenal thing. Because out of any other substances out there that I would, I would, I would, just any out of any other substances out there, I feel like psychedelics, if used in the right setting with the right lead, is probably one of the most beneficial things. A hundred percent. I think that we're going to start illegal. to see uh, quite a lot more like therapy in that space as well. Um, I know you're already doing mm -hmm. some stuff like that in America, but I think from like a mental health perspective, it's one hundred percent going to be the future. Um, I'm going to have to let you know in three minutes. I'm going to have to have a hard stop at 9 30 a.m because i've got uh some of my employees waiting for me in the office uh at that point so yeah i'll have to leave within the next few minutes i'm afraid no yeah that's perfect i was actually just closing so um i have one last question to ask you if you were to die tonight and you could broadcast to the world one thing what would you say um, oh that's a tough one i don't know if i'd do something funny or i'd take the piss you know, say something like up the bum, no babies or man that goes to bed with a itchy <laughs> bum will wake up with smelly finger. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll probably probably tell the joke or I'll be like, oh, you'll be dead soon. So enjoy yourself. Nice. <laughs> nice, man. Awesome. Well, I uh, I really enjoyed this podcast, dude, and I love your content. It's it's hilarious and phenomenal. And you do make a lot of good points. So I appreciate you for coming on. Where can the uh, audience find you? Uh, yeah, if they're interested in coming to the tour, jamesmith.live got all the dates there everything they need um and yeah if it's james smith on socials and if my, my name doesn't come up when you type in james smith i've not been doing my name right i've uh, not been doing my job right awesome thanks man cheers bro uh so guys if you want to uh, support the podcast you can rate us a five stars on anywhere you can find your podcast and then finally if you guys want to um, inquire about trt or you feel like you have symptoms of low t then transcend hrt will provide you with some medical advice and you can find the link below in the description so thanks again for james or thanks again james for for coming on goodbye thanks for having <laughs> thanks, me thanks man i appreciate it see you in a bit yeah you too peace <laughs>